is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. I am Alex Tapscott here with co-host Andrew Young. There's a meme in crypto about programmable money, the idea that we can use smart contracts to basically take assets and program a whole bunch of economic instructions into them. And we've seen that play out in many different areas of DeFi uh, around lending and trading and so forth. And it's something that has you know, gone from a promise to something that has been, I think, fulfilled. But one of the most interesting areas, areas of programmable money today is the idea of programming our values into our money. What are the ways that we can actually um, put into economic systems things that matter to us, not just from a financial perspective, but as a society? How do we address the social, material, intellectual, experiential, and cultural uh, needs of, of humanity? And how do we take this concept of DeFi, decentralized finance, and convert it or, or evolve it to this concept of refi, re, regenerative finance. Um, that's a term that has caught on recently as this sector of Web3 has grown in importance. Uh, it's something that's championed by several individuals in the space, uh, many people within the Ethereum community and the Cosmos community. Kevin Awaki, who's the founder of Gitcoin, uh, wrote a terrific op-ed about this towards the end of last year, laying out his idea. And uh, building on that is our guest for today, um, Gregory Landua, who is the founder, uh, co-founder of Regen Network. So Regen Network is a community-owned and operated eco-credit registry and marketplace. It is designed to support living carbon and biodiversity markets and others with verification, asset issuance, and community standards and governance. Before founding Regen Network, Greg co -wrote, Gregory co-wrote the Regenerative Enterprise, a groundbreaking book outlining pathways to achieve ecological and social regeneration through business, and co-founded and grew Terra Genesis International from a regenerative agriculture consultancy and design firm into a leader in the regenerative movement. So we want to talk about regenerative finance and programming values into money and into assets. I can't really think of a better person uh, than Gregory to join us on the show. So without further ado, Gregory, welcome to DeFi Decoded. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. I'm excited to dive in. Yeah. So before we uh, jumped on the call, we had a brief chat about your background. And as I described in the introduction, um, you know, you've got this long history in the regenerative movement and also in um, these areas of what I would call like social enterprise or environmental enterprise. And I would just love to understand um, how it is that you came to discover you know, blockchains and, and Web3 as a potential uh, you know, powerful toolkit or, or potential solution to some of the things that you've long addressed in your professional career? Yeah, definitely. So um, I came across the Bitcoin white paper pretty much right when it was published um, or starting to be circulated after Satoshi wrote it and published it, because back in 2007, 2008, 2009, I was very interested in alternative the alternative currency movement, um, Bernard Leotard's work, local exchange trading system, mutual credit systems, most of which are sort of a form of digital money. But at, at that stage, we're not leveraging cryptographic consensus or proof of work, let alone proof of stake as has evolved later. So, you know, I was just really interested in sort of a novel form of digital money and kind of paying attention to it and, you know, excited about it. And even back then, the sort of like seeds of kind of uh, some form of ecological currency or bioregional currency were kind of already um, growing, I guess, in my mind and my work. And then, you know, it took a while for me to, you know, lean in and get more engaged. Um, we had a sort of in my peer group was one of the, you know, Ethereum launch team. And he and I had been chatting a lot about, you know, my work on the eight forms of capital and regenerative enterprise and how that might um, play 
in the creation of smart contracts and sort of you know leveraging things and it wasn't really until 2017 as the ICO boom really started to go into full swing that I felt that the you know the the social window like the the Overton window the yeah. the ability for enough a critical mass of people to be leaning in and engaging with this kind of reinvention of money yeah. uh, um, was was just really there was just enough momentum to have a place to start to experiment with this idea of programming ecological health and ecological regeneration into financial and monetary systems. And so it was in 2017 that Region Network was founded and we decided to start really sort of approaching this problem set and we wrote the white paper and just started engaging deeper. I do have to say like between, you know, let's say 2009 and 2000 and, you know, 2017 or so in that gap, I remained somewhat skeptical of both Bitcoin and Ethereum in from from my perspective their utility those two approaches to blockchain and their utility in what i think is really the sort of transformative power of digital money and programming money and governance around sort of what we value and how we value it um, so they're really amazing experiments and they play really i think increasingly important roles in the economy but for sort of my passion and this idea of bringing living carbon and living capital into a representation in our economy, neither Ethereum nor Bitcoin really feels like it fits the bill. And so it wasn't actually until a little bit later in 2017, um, when the Cosmos ICO happened and, you know, a little bit preceding that when the Cosmos white paper was out, that I felt like there was a plausible match between sort of the blockchain technology, the tech stack that's needed, the sort of like governance approach and tools and the real sort of like eco story of ecological money and ecological regeneration. Well, I want to get into that a little bit just because, you know, in 2017, um, looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're both proof of work systems. They're both using a lot of energy. And we know now that Ethereum has made the move um, last September. But, you know, it's it is I can imagine looking at this. OK, here's a new technology that can help, uh, you know, that allows you to program assets and, you know, clear and settle transactions peer to peer. And that's something that's could be useful for lots of different kinds of marketplaces, including potentially, you know, the market for carbon. But, you know, at what cost? I, I mean, I, you know, you're looking at like trying to do colored coins or something on Bitcoin. I mean, the Bitcoin network uses an inordinate amount of energy. And I think that that's those two kinds of ideas have always been at odds. And I think that uh, for a lot of people looking from the outside, looking in, they look at the space and they think, OK, well, you know, these blockchains, I've heard they use a lot of energy. And you're telling me that somehow they're going to be a solution to a bunch of you know um, problems that exist in in the economy as it relates to to the carbon footprint of, of industry and, the, and of economic activity. So you know it's a bit of I think for a lot of people they would almost roll their eyes at that. Like they seem like kind of counterintuitive concepts. So I'd love to get a better understanding on that journey of okay, you figure out Cosmos and we know we've had people from Cosmos. You know Cosmos is a proof of stake blockchain. Doesn't really use any more energy than you know a bunch of data centers, right? Um, and it's something that I think has drawn a lot of social entrepreneurs and and people that care about higher level issues like yourself um, to the community. And so tell us about that part of the journey. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely from sort of from the start, a proof of stake system um, or potentially even a proof of authority system when dealing with ecological markets and issues and attributes um, has always made much more sense than a proof of work system. Um, you know, we can go into a more a sort of esoteric and deep dive around, uh, you know, I think the naive dismissal of proof of work is just that, you know, so I'm definitely not on team destroy all proof of work systems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we can get dig into that too, because I, but, I, I tend know. to agree with you that the, 
the critics typically have an agenda and they don't always, well, they rarely represent the facts accurately. Yeah. And, and if it was sort of like, if I was the type of person that sort of like stuck with the easy story, it's very easy to dismiss proof of work. And as you say, that was one of the drivers for us. Like it was a non-starter to use Ethereum to do what we we're doing first because of proof of work, also because of our perspective about sort of this idea of a monolithic blockchain architecture. I mean, from yeah, yeah. even from back in the day, we were like, mm, this isn't really going to work for the type of um, dat data demands, throughput demands, performance and governance needs that a state machine, a blockchain that is allowing us to build a consensus about ecological state and then to program that ecological state data into financial and monetary flows um at least at that point you know and i think ethereum has come a long way and there's a lot of convergence interestingly enough between cosmos and ethereum and increasingly the ethereum com community is sort of like bending towards modularity and composability and there's you know sort of like app roll-up systems and all these sort of very cosmosy ideas so there's sort of like but we were very much that that's what made sense to us from first principles, from kind of a computer science governance data architecture approach. Um, the Cosmos vision really was was much closer to how we thought these systems needed to be built. And so we we sort of from day one we were, you know, thinking about Tendermint and thinking about then th later thinking about the Cosmos SDK as kind of the base structure for. The, the building out of things. And I think I, I really resonate with a lot of what um, Ethan Buckman talks about, you know, and I, I oftentimes describe, and I think this is sort of parallel to his thinking, that blockchain technology is really this leap from an internet made up of personal computers that we, you know, that then to run those personal computers, whether it's a supercomputer or a laptop, it's sort of like it's an interface that one person runs, right? Or there's one sysadmin. And then in the background, we take care of sort of the legal agreements and like the contracts and how we choose to administer the system gets is all sort of like off of the computer, right? And uh, the, this leap into the blockchain world is this leap towards social computing, in which more of the agreements about how the database is run, how the compute is being run, what the computer is doing, how it's doing it, are actually explicit and encoded into the, the program that the computer is running. So we're sort of like shifting from this personal computer paradigm into a social or community computer paradigm. And that's that's a really important leap when we're talking about market mechanisms for common pool resources and public goods, ecological health, carbon markets, because most of the challenges in the in that specific domain that Region Network is interested in, that, that I've been passionate about for a long time, require groups of people to essentially build consensus about complex scientific observation of ecosystem health, biodiversity, carbon cycle information. So you really have to have this sort of public record approach, this community consensus approach to everything that's being, you know, potentially produced and traded. You, It's really much more clunky to do that as just sort of like, um, sort of like private individual citizens engaging. Um, and we can get it. There's a whole nother thing, which I think is really important for people to understand in terms of the role of blockchains in in this, you know, as as we're moving through the, you know, farther into the 21st century, you know, the, the cost to commit digital fraud, right, to, to generate fraudulent claims is getting ever lower because of artificial intelligence. You know, you can sort of deep fake things, you can generate spam emails, you know, basically for free, you can do all these different things. What's really interesting is this, this idea of a social compute network that has sort of a public private key infrastructure actually provides an interesting antidote to this sort of like current free for all of the internet, where we can actually build distributed identity systems, we can build, we can sort of guarantee through application of crypt cryptography, 
digital signatures and durability of the record of provenance of data. And again, that's those are essential pieces, building blocks, who is saying what about where, using what methodology and what data, those are essential building blocks for, for instance, a carbon credit, right? Without that information being easily accessible, durable, and immutable, like essentially like unchangeable, uncorruptible, we should say, mm-hmm. the market really has a hard time pricing the accuracy and precision of a claim and therefore finding a price for a carbon credit. And you see the tumult in the carbon markets due to these debates and challenges around how accurate and how real a carbon credit is, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I would also say that that same issue, interestingly enough, we're facing at, at like writ large at a societal scale with news and information everywhere. And I think we're going to start to see increasingly the role of the sort of like the public blockchain in making sense of what the hell is going on with the world is going to be increasingly important. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most exciting things to me about uh, Region Network is, is is the fact that you're bringing you're essentially bringing real world assets on, on chain um, with, with carbon credits as as kind of a good example. And we talk a lot on our show about how sort of stable coins have been by far the most sort of successful application uh, of of a blockchain. And if you think about USDC, it's really just bringing making US dollars more accessible for anyone. Uh, at the click of a button. Um, but obviously one of the big challenges with sort of real world assets being tokenized has been um, just kind of, I guess, what you would call counterparty risk. Uh, we actually even saw it with USDC uh, over the last month where it sort of depegged because the custodian of the sort of underlying US dollars, uh, <laughs> there, there were some issues obviously with them having their money at Silicon Valley Bank and all these other banks. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think one of the my biggest questions um, because to me, the, the, the objective of, of this is, is very clear, but I guess the, the big potential obstacle is, is how do you deal with that sort of custodian risk, right? Because at the end of the day, the carbon credits are tokenized, but they're, they're as you said, they're sort of held uh, somewhere in the real world. Uh, and you guys deal with all of that sort of backend of infrastructure, um, which is you know, a huge benefit to the user. Uh, I'm just curious, how do... How do users feel safe knowing that the sort of carbon credits uh, actually represent the claims that they sort of are backed by? Right. So, I mean, I think this is a progressive story. So I think, you know, where this ends up going, right, is sort of a full Ricardian on-chain contract, a full expression of the counterparty agreements in a world in which the asset itself is completely digitally native and isn't necessarily referencing a bundle of sort of like, you know, off-chain agreements and other other things. And so the full sort of like risk and responsibility is living on the blockchain. It's fully digitally native. And again, the the agreements, you know, in this case, you know, the the core of a carbon asset, the core of of a contract related to carbon is about present and future land use agreements, right? So the core does require a very strong, I guess you could say it's sort of like rule of law and respect of, you know, property. The interesting thing here is that we're sort of expanding property rights so that the rights and responsibilities to the community, right, about how an individual landholder manages that property are starting to be valued and expressed. And so an agreement between whether it's an indigenous community or an individual farmer in the Midwest, you know, like either of those examples, like an indigenous community that has collective ownership of a forest, say in the Amazon, or a farmer in the Midwest, right? In either case, the the, the land title holder, whether it's a community or an individual, is making a promise to a whole bunch of other people that they're going to manage that land in a particular way. The farmer in the Midwest may shift to no-till agriculture, may shift to silviculture, may do holistic management grazing. These actions that increase soil health and sequester carbon and reduce nutrient runoff and all these other things that produce public goods for the 
communities downstream and the broader world, right? In the, in the Amazon example, those communities may just promise to not cut down their forest, right? Because the Amazon is essentially the heart and lungs of the world. So the whole hydrological cycle and the cooling effect that that has depends on this giant ancient forest in the Amazon. Like, you know, that forest is 40 million years old <laughs> that, 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 that's being stewarded there. It has a key role to play in our biosphere, the health of our biosphere. So there's an agreement between specific counterparties. Now that agreement, what the, being able to fulfill that agreement, right? In each case is a is individual humans or a community of humans stewarding a landscape in a specific way that produces a benefit to counterparties. So in the case of that rainforest, or in the case of that farm, you can monitor whether or not they are indeed completing their agreement, right? So you can stream, uh, you know, basically live satellite information on a day-by-day -day basis and see if that forest is in fact intact or see if that farmer has tilled or not tilled their farm. And yeah. so where we're headed here is a world in which we have dynamic agreements, Instead of these very clunky old style agreements where we're like, okay, we're making a 30 year easement on your property. And every five years, somebody's going to show up and maybe check on it. And it's just like this really slow, laggy sort of resolution. The cost, the marginal cost to actually have a dynamic agreement and basically program, turn carbon credits into this static, sort of bureaucratic, old style kind of asset into a dynamic asset that has essentially real-time monitoring of the specific agreements between the parties that's yeah. now that's happening presently right and where's this interesting i will say like on region network you have this yeah. interesting scenario for anybody who's been paying attention we're just now building a bridge for the nature carbon ton which is an asset that this protocol called toucan tokenized which is basically tokenized old legacy carbon Right. So it's just simply tokenizing the old way that things happen. Right. To experiment with liquidity and some transparency benefits and some other things. But it is essentially not changing the fundamental way that the carbon asset is created. And we have the second generation of carbon that is currently on region as well, which is city forest credits, which is like a new registry, which we have a sort of like two way agreement with, and they can mint their assets into our marketplace. And it's, it's like more deeply integrated second generation, the third generation of carbon assets is what I'm talking about, where you have these digitally native blockchain native dynamic real time monitoring opportunities where the, the, there is no off chain agreement or representation the asset itself is completely a blockchain native asset and the agreements about how that came to be can, are encoded into the metadata they're in, in and even encoded into dynamic you know, potentially dynamic price feeds and other things. And so that third generation, which is really what Region Network is excited about as a community and an R&D public benefit corp, the company I'm CEO of, this is where we've been headed, right? This is just now really for the first time in the, in the history of humans, this idea of a dynamic representation of an ecological asset is coming into the marketplace for the first time this year, basically. So yeah. first generation, second generation, and third generation can all coexist in the same marketplace. What's it? Okay, so I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, so number one, it's thank you for, for uh, describing the way it works, that there are these three different kinds of, of um, carbon assets. So basically, like you're a, a marketplace of sorts where other people who have created some form of a digitized carbon credit can um, trade and retire credits, you know, on your marketplace, right? And so that's that's and 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 it's one where you don't have to go fully on chain for this to work. There is almost like a, a on ramp of sorts where you can start with legacy credits that have been tokenized, so to speak. But ultimately, and and I think this is true for a lot of projects in DeFi and in Web three, the the holy grail or no, is is a state where all of the agreements are on chain. Um, having said that, 
even in the last category, the third generation, um, you don't have to worry about has someone else done the, you know, is the carbon credit itself valid? But you still have an Oracle problem of sorts, don't you? Because you are not a problem like an Oracle challenge, which is, okay, in order for the credit itself to be valid, you need to know that that land use uh, agreement is in place. You need to know that, you know, it's being stewarded in a certain way. And so there is a data feed of sorts that needs to go into this digital asset, right? So like, how does that, how does that come into play when there's, when it's, when there's a lot of, when I guess it's a monitoring question, right? Like it's, you have to monitor a, a situation. I mean, you know more about this than I do, but you know, how is this, you know, chunk of the Amazon being stewarded? Is it being done in a way that meets the standards of our on-chain credit? Can you talk about that process? Like let's, let's assume for a second that uh, number one and two, you know, tokenizing the old way of doing things is a good starting point. But like, let's get to the end point and talk about how how that actually wor works. Sure. So let's split it out into two sections. So one is, as you very accurately described, there's this monitoring question. But beneath that, it's really important to also address the methodological question. Okay. How are we monitoring? And is it, uh, is the monitoring approach adequate to the agreement that we're making between people. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's actually where that's that's in some ways that's the more complex question, right? Um, so so first let's deal with that and then let's deal with the then sort of the implementation of monitoring and how that works. So fundamentally answering the question of how we monitor in order to decide if we're meeting an agreement between people, that's a social negotiation process between a community of actors who are trying to basically say, like come to consensus with one another about whether or not the, the methodological approach is adequate for a transaction to be based on, right? And so that's where, you know, region network is sort of a governance chain. Right, so we're using the state machine of Region Network, this pub public proof of stake blockchain, to be able to allow the functionality of communities to come together and work through a public process, where that whole process of the decisions and compromises and agreements that are made about a methodological approach to create a credit, there's like a public record and a public governance process of that, that then is the reference point that the market can use to decide whether or not it agrees with that specific approach, right? And so that's a leap. That's a sort of leap beyond the way the legacy system works in which there is really, you know, the, the, the people have tried to do good public process. You know, I'm like, people do good public process, but you just can't until the rate, you know, the, the birth of the public blockchain, it's very hard to encode all of that in a way that's immutable and accessible and sort of like baked in to the way the platform works, right? So in order to get a credit on to region, you have to go through a process where you're sort of like making all these decisions and making them in a public forum so that the market can choose whether or not it's confident in the choices that have been made at the methodological level. So that's number one. Yeah. Then number two, the implementation of that, that, that basically dictates a, a, a monitoring approach. That's one of the key questions that's being asked and answered in that kind of process, right? In the registry governance process. Okay, so then you're implementing a monitoring approach. Now, we take a, I guess, sort of a trust graph approach right? Where what you're aiming to do, again, is to have a, a durable, immutable record of, you know, who is providing monitoring, again, linked to what's the methodologies being followed, what are the approved approaches, data sources, etc. So you can basically, what, what you're doing is not creating some sort of ironclad guarantee that the data is perfect, because that's impossible, both for scientific reasons, as well as for sort of like cheating reasons. But what you're doing is you're making it really cheap to uncover fraud, yeah. right? And really expensive if that fraud is shown, right? So that's that's the first foundation here, because we have this sort of like, again, this, this durable, immutable record 
of who is saying what about where using what kind of device, what kind of data, what kind of methodology. And did that method all is that methodological approach on the approved list of the credit? And if it isn't, you can't even, you know, mint the asset. So furthermore, people can yeah. people can encode if they want, like identity, like who, what address is capable of providing the data, mm-hmm. right? So you get all of these choices when you're setting up a crediting approach that can gate things. I think it's a little early to know exactly what's going to be the most efficient and effective way. But again, taking a step back from an architectural perspective, the way we're approaching this is from a trust graph approach where it's like what's important is we're building out this record of who's saying what, how is it supported? And then you can basically go back in history and you can be like, oh, you know, that data provider or that approach or that methodology has been shown to not work or those people cheated. And that basically allows the market to be incredibly intelligent and to drive the price signal where it needs to go, which is act towards accuracy, precision and real world impact. Right. So you don't get so, that off the bat. You don't just get to like we can't sprinkle magic blockchain fairy dust and solve all of the monitoring problems. Right. Yeah. It just It just serves as a substrate for fair dealing and calibration. So we really think of it as a community. So region network will get smarter and smarter, more and more precise and more and more accurate, the more it's being used and the more the community is engaging with asking and answering questions. And the assets, therefore, will get more and more valuable. So so with all of these things, I I think we can kind of assume that the, the, the... the assets will become sort of like you said more the infrastructure will become better and better over time but at the end of the day the most important thing for most sort of financial markets is liquidity so is there is there i mean we've talked to a lot of sort of defi founders of the years um and, and one big thing they've done is sort of liquidity mining uh obviously kind of the, the early generations of liquidity mining were uh, a little naive in their design um but i'm just curious is there how are you thinking about liquidity formation and uh are, are there any sort of like web3 native strategies like liquidity mining um that you're thinking about using to sort of uh, help with that yeah so well so first off i'll say a controversial thing which is i don't think liquidity is the problem and i think people are wrong about their fixation on liquidity and I'll answer, yes, there's some really cool things happening out in the community related to um, liquid stake and region stake and liquidity, like carbon liquidity pools that are being experimented with because some people disagree with me and think that liquidity is really important. I personally don't think liquidity is as important as people think. I think it's more about the velocity of exchange. So that's a different way of thinking about demand, um, right? Where, you know, I think what we really need is to just have sort of like, essentially like reoccurring carbon subscriptions, basically, where, because it's a commodity and the, that commodity needs to be used and it needs to be used in a more and more real-time fashion. And so to the degree to which what we're really doing is creating an efficient supply system that is producing carbon and moving it into the the place in the market where the demand is and then retiring it, right? Because it has utility. Then I think as you build that velocity, then we can create sort of financial uh, financialization processes off of that velocity of exchange and movement. And then, then you could build sort of liquidity and financial instruments and maybe securitize things and do indexes and other cool sort of um, DeFi pr- products on it. But the the foundation here really has to do with the supply and demand and sort of like the manufacturing in quotes process of these, these primary ecological units, right? And getting them where they need to go. And liquidity in my mind is, is a little bit of distraction um, until you actually have built out the the system and sort of like are making it move. Of course, it's also you know you know you you need mechanisms to do to do good pricing. You know, and and liquidity and AMMs can help that. And there's second generation AMMs 
or third generation now with you know Uniswap v3 and where Osmosis is going with sort of being able to do um, not just a naive liquidity system, but for people to basically almost put like bids and bids and sell orders into the liquidity pool. So you have more structured liquidity, right? Um, I'm excited about more structured liquidity, actually. Um, mm -hmm. But so I'll pause there and see if you've got pushback or questions or, you know, how that lands. <clears throat> well, um, just building off of what you said, I mean, you know, I think that that having spent my career in financial markets, you know, I agree with Andrew that liquidity is very important. But I also agree with you, Gregory, that um, there's a lot of things that need to go right first before you're even thinking about that that challenge, right? Um, and and I and that leads me to sort of my next question, which is, you have this trust graph that you want to use as a way and a governance process to validate who can participate and the nature of the credits and so forth. But there are already global standards set by governments and, 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 you know, standards bodies around carbon credits. And I'm just wondering, like, are you trying to do it differently? Um, because you find that those systems are flawed? Or um, are you trying to, like, what, put it put the putting the question another way? Why can't you just like turn this on for a standard that already exists? Um, like whether it's the European or standard or North American standard for carbon credit. Um, it, it seems like you're kind of creating your own based on your own system of, of standards. Am I getting that right? Or maybe I'm misunderstanding that. Well, it's a bit of a both and. So we are sort of, we, we like to say backwards compatible and forward facing. So, okay. so we have this bridge to Toucan. Toucan has tokenized legacy carbon. We have this sort of two-way registry integration with city forest credits. Um, and, you know, we'll sort of progressively build out tools so that existing registry systems and existing carbon systems can simply like integrate and own their own tokenization tools essentially, right? But it's really important, actually, the, the hard questions that need to be asked and answered at a registry level or, or at this sort of like governance, standards governance level, do have to do with how are you programming the asset? And if all you're doing is sort of naively tokenizing from existing registries, you're not really taking advantage of blockchain at all. You're just going straight for liquidity, mm -hmm. right? That's really the only benefit you get if you're just naively tokenizing from an existing registry system. And that's, a, as you said, like liquidity is important. It's a thing. You get sort of like transparent price discovery, liquidity. You can see that. It's, it's much more of a transparent, rational market. But... Going a layer deeper, the ability for a community of people to come to consensus about how and what they're going to program into the asset, monitoring rules, um, you know, retirement rules, royalty rules. These are all the harder, sticky questions to create a high quality carbon credit, right? And, and doing that natively and showing how that can be done natively um, is really important. And the legacy carbon markets are incredibly slow to engage with something novel because they're always in this rear guard battle against critics. <laughs> There's like this, the psychology of the marketplace is really important to understand. The, the legacy, I really sympathize with this, but the legacy market actors have always been getting attacked by people who really just fundamentally don't believe that markets have any place whatsoever in doing anything good in the world. And starting from that worldview, there's like a constant attack on carbon credits. Like this is just greenwashing. This is just a license to pollute. This is just, you know, the baseline's wrong. This is wrong. That's wrong. It's so they're in a constant reactive defensive nature and therefore actually like wading in and engaging it from sort of like the ground up to be like, hey, this is how this like social computing system can allow a group of stakeholders to program in standards, values, and asset behavior so that you can get exactly what you want as a community out of your carbon asset. That is, you know, with all of the FUD around crypto and blockchain, combining with the rear guard action that carbon actors are in all the time, it's just kind of like a no-go to sort of like wade in and just support the build out for a legacy org. So that sort of gets, that happens, you know, through 
you know, Toucan and City Forest. So there's like ways that we're trying to sort of show and engage with existing credit systems. But also there's sort of like, there's a huge amount of hunger for novel approaches. So the, so I've been sort of explaining the, the um, my armchair psychology perception of why there's resistance or restraint to sort of like leaping in and innovating in the existing carbon markets because right. of the sort of inherent conservatism of an industry that's in constant defensive mode. And I think it's important to understand there is also um, all those standards were written in like the 90s, right? It's 2023. We have literally, we have real-time satellite information that refreshes on a daily and weekly basis from public and private sources. We have machine learning we have, you know, that just like radically shifts how efficient we can make statistical representations of complex ecological science outcomes. Yeah. We have new forms of sensors. We have all of these different things. And the legacy institutions are really struggling to keep up with the pace of the technological change. So you have this intersection of sort of big data, big ecological data, let's call it, with artificial intelligence, with blockchain technology, really ushering in a completely new paradigm for how these assets are generated. And so, so while we're excited to be backwards compatible and like yeah. create these bridges and show how this all can be used and it's open source and it can be sort of like leveraged freely, whether it's on region network, or they, this is the beauty of like a cosmos approach, or they want to create their own blockchain that is governed by a consortium or whatever they're comfortable with from a sort of like legal and liability perspective, they can either use a public network, or they could create a, a private network that's IBC compatible and can have all of the benefits with none of the perceived trade trade offs. So there's that reality that we're sort of we've been carefully stewarding and there's also the reality that there's a huge amount of appetite amongst communities to build new carbon standards because people don't like the existing ones and right. so servicing that sort of like latent demand for people to innovate and express new forms of you know of asset natural asset creation yeah right where you know, biodiversity credits and living carbon credits and indigenous owned and operated crediting facilities. The, you know, one of the biggest critiques of legacy carbon markets has always been that it has that it's sort of top down and tends to impose sort of a colonial imposition on, for instance, indigenous people or smallholder farmers, instead of really like acknowledging that they're actually sort of like in the driver's seat when it comes to producing the most effective ecological assets. So what does it look like to have them be fully empowered as owner operators of a system? That's one of the key questions that Region Network is really asking and how we're developing things. Well, I think that's a great way to end it. Um, I love that idea of being uh, backward um, compatible, but forward looking. And also the idea that for a lot of um, people, ownership is essential to you know being a stakeholder, right? And there's uh, the ownership web. Uh, web three is the thing that can empower people to, you know, be owners of, um, you know, new financial applications or new social applications or new, you know, art collectives or potentially new systems for um, scoring, recording, and, and retiring carbon um, and maybe you know saving the world while we're at it. Not to get too hyperbolic, but I think that's a, a great way to end it. Gregory, thank you so much for your time. It was a really fascinating discussion. Uh, for people who want to learn more, where should they go? Well, you can go to region.network and there's a pretty nice guide there. If you want to connect with us on Twitter um, or me on Twitter, Gregory underscore Landua. Um, so I'm fairly active. Um, we have Discord and Telegram. All the links there are are on region.network. Yeah, you're a great follow on uh, on Twitter. <laughs> I would encourage people to to. to... Uh, please follow and uh, check out Regen.network while we're at it. That's it for this week's DeFi Decoded. Gregory, again, thank you so much for your time and generosity and for your great insights. And Andrew, great to see you too. We will see everybody next week. Until then, take care. Bye. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized. 
or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction.